Welcome from Berlin to the webinar, the Energy Vende and the Transition Energetic. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome almost uh, actually 200 participants watching, listening today our webinar, uh, which show, I guess, the very strong interest on uh, the debates currently ongoing in Europe and in France and Germany in, in, in particular on the future of energy system. Uh, as you probably know, key policy decisions are actually about to be taken in the months to come in France and in Germany. Uh, France uh, should release its multi-year energy plan in October. Germany uh, is ongoing very important discussion in the framework of the coal commission to uh, define a pathway out of coal. And we expect a decision by the end of this year or beginning of next year. So I guess the timing of this webinar is especially interesting. And uh, it is based on a joint study that we have been performed, Agora Energie Vende, with IDRI and with the support of the consulting firm Artelis. Uh, this study was published in spring. 2018, so already a couple of months ago, in French, but a German translation has been released in August. And this study that we will present assess the co-dependent impacts of German and French choices on nuclear and coal in the context of renewable energy development. We believe this is indeed a good timing to address these uh, issues now in the national policy debate because uh, the national choices have actually regional and European implication meaning a choice made in one country could have actually a strong growing influence uh, in its uh, neighbors or in the rest of Europe, especially in the context of growing interconnection. So for this webinar, I am joined by uh, the co-author of this uh, report, Nicola Bergman, which, uh, who is research fellow on energy and climate policy at IDRI, the Institute of uh, Sustainable Development and International Relations, a think tank based in Paris. And my name is Dimitri Pesha. I am senior associate at Agora Energie Vende, a European think tank based in Berlin on power sector transformation. And IDRI and Agora have been cooperating for several years uh, for now on the question of uh, how effectively implement uh, efficient power sector transformation. The presentation today will last about 25 minutes and it will be followed by uh, about 30 minutes uh, Q&A. So before we begin, allow me uh, to give you some word on technical issues and also how you can contribute to the discussion we'll have later on. All the information related to this webinar can be found on our website. You will find the study, but you will also find the webinar presentation that can be downloaded directly from the webinar software. I think you should find it on the left of the screen. Uh, the recording of the oral uh, webinar will also be uploaded uh, on our website and on our YouTube channel. So uh, a little chat window will also appear now on your screen and this chat window can be used for us to send us real-time questions on the presentation. This question will only appear on our screen, uh, the other webinar participants will not see them and we will reply to this question only at the end uh, of the presentation. So if you want to be named explicitly when you pose a question, please mention your name and uh, affiliation when you type the question. We will try to cover as many questions as possible during the Q&A session, and the remaining question will then be uh, taken uh, up by email afterwards. Uh, this uh, chat window can also be used to submit ne technical questions. Uh, if you have uh, any technical problems, if the sound is too uh, high, or if you see any other things which can help us to improve the quality. And my colleagues here sitting in the room that you don't see, but Christophe, uh, Catherine, and, and Muriel, uh, will uh, seek to help you as far as possible. So thanks to all of them. So now I think we are ready to, to start. So let's go to the presentation. Um, I will start first by giving you um, a bit of a broader European uh, framework before we dig into the French and German agenda. I think this is important to state that uh, just before the summer, important um, agreements have been reached uh, in Europe on key pieces of legislation, one on renewable energy and one on energy efficiency. This means that we see a trend line in Europe for the development of renewables uh, and this target at the European level imply about a share of 50% renewables in the power sector by 2030. This in the framework of uh, declining cost of renewables, which are really becoming the key uh, driver for the transition in Europe. At the same time, this clean energy for all uh, package will advance the European integration, meaning a stronger uh, convergence of the power markets uh, through uh, power market design reform, 
and also an increase of interconnectors development are foreseen. Another important trend is the electricity demand. Uh, we expect uh, the electricity demand to uh, stabilize over the years to come because of the gain of energy efficiency, which uh, will be uh, compensated by additional demand uh, driven by new electric use, like heat pumps or electric vehicles. Final point, there is an ongoing discussion to higher the climate ambition at the European level. And here, France is uh, playing a key role in leading a country of um, willing countries to strengthen the European commitment to go beyond the current target of uh, reducing the CO2 emission of 40% to a level could, uh, which could reach about 55% by 2030. And France is also a leading country in order to introduce new climate instruments like a CO2 tax or a minimum price on uh, the uh, power sector. Now, let's have a look at um, the Let's have a look at the French and German energy strategies. I think, in a nutshell, it is interesting to state that while the starting points in France and, uh, and Germany are different, the long-term challenges are similar. Integrating renewable energy while reducing, resizing the conventional power plant fleet. So, if you see on this graph, the targets for France and, and Germany in terms of renewables, you see here the renewable target for France, 40% of the power production in 2030. Where in Germany, we have this new uh, adopted target a couple of months ago of uh, 65% in 2030 of the power demand must be covered by renewables. So similar efforts when it comes to developing renewables. At the same time, the future of conventional power plants is uncertain in both countries today. First of all, France. France has today a share of about 75% nuclear in its uh, power, power mix, and um, the government is committed to reduce this share to 50%. But how to reach this target and when to reach it is yet unclear, and this decision is taking place in the context of an aging nuclear fleet, meaning there is some reinvestment needed in order to keep some nuclear power plants online, which will reach more than 40 years lifetime. If nothing is done, France would lose about 35 gigawatts by 2025. For Germany, here again, we have uncertainty regarding the trajectory of the coal power plants. You see here the trajectory, which is a decommissioning after the end of the technical lifetime of power plants. Now the question is, is this path sufficient to meet the climate targets? The answer is no. And there is an ongoing discussion on how to put this target in line with the climate commitment of Germany. An important work is ongoing in the framework of the Coal Commission in Germany. So thank you, Dimitri, for this intro introduction. Uh, now we're going to dig into uh, what we did in this study and uh, what are the results uh, for France, Germany, and for the rest of Europe. So first, uh, but basically what we did in this study is to analyze plausible intersecting scenarios uh, of evolution of the power mix in 2030 for France and Germany and uh, to ask us uh, to ask uh, to try to answer uh, these questions so first what uh, uh, the planned development of uh, renewable energy how it will impact the utilization of conventional power plants so coal uh, in Germany nuclear in France and what would be the results of uh, plausible scenarios in terms of power flows uh, in Europe between French, Germany, but al also be, uh, with other countries, in terms of CO2 emissions, in terms of market prices and revenues for the different uh, uh, power technologies, uh, generation technologies. So the modeling has been performed by the consultancy Artelis. It basically constitutes a uh, full, uh, uh, full 2030 uh, year simulated at uh, a one uh, hour uh, time path. Uh, and uh, now I'm going to explain the different scenarios that have been taken in France and Germany. So in France, we really focused on the question of uh, the nuclear power plant uh, fleet. Uh, so we have three scenarios uh, where uh, uh, renewable uh, energy development have, have been kept the same. And the three scenarios are a high nuclear scenario, uh, meaning that we keep uh, the current uh, capacity in place at 63 gigawatts, 
a medium nuclear uh, uh, scenario where uh, in 2030, uh, 13 gigawatts have been taken out uh, of the French system, and a low nuclear scenario corresponding at the four, uh, to a 40 gigawatt uh, capacity uh, in the 2030. Uh, in Germany, so we have uh, two main scenarios uh, on coal. One uh, uh, that corresponds to medium coal, it means that we keep all power plants until the end of their technical lifetime, so it's 45 uh, years uh, time, and we still have 24.3 gigawatts of coal uh, in Germany in 2030. The low coal scenario is a scenario developed in a previous study by Agora, and uh, corresponds to a coal exit strategy uh, in 2040. So it means that they're still in, 2030, uh, in 2040, sorry. Uh, so there is still uh, in 2030, 18 uh, gigawatts of uh, coal in the German system. Uh, so uh, these scenarios have been studied, the, low, uh, the coal exit strategy has been studied with a higher amount of renewable energy uh, and developed than uh, the previous uh, agreed targets. So in the uh, uh, coal exit strategy, renewable uh, electricity represents 60% of uh, the power generation in Germany in 2030. We also did a variation on this scenario where um, um, the coal exit strategy is not compensated by this increase in re renewable energy uh, development. And we did also a different kind of, uh, uh, of variation on the medium nuclear and medium coal scenario, where we studied a higher CO2 price and to see the effect in terms of revenues, in terms of power flows uh, between France and Germany. So in all, all the rest of uh, the hypothesis as, as, uh, stay stable uh, in the country, so it means electricity demand is the same in uh, all uh, the study, the interconnectors, are developing, uh, we uh, see uh, increased capacity of interconnectors, uh, where 50% of the new uh, projects included in the TYNDP are developed. CO2 uh, price and energy price are kept the same, so CO2 price is kept at 30 euro per ton, and we have this variation only in one scenario uh, with the higher CO2 price. So let's dig into the results now. So first, for France, uh, one interesting result is uh, that we see that uh, regarding uh, the cap nuclear capacity kept in the system, CO2 emissions uh, the does not increase, and even on the contrary, it decreases in all scenarios. That's because uh, uh, besides the renewable uh, energy development and uh, the nuclear power uh, uh, capacity, the coal uh, power plants uh, are taken out of the system, it's already uh, announced by the government for 2022. Uh, and this, as, as a result, there's no increase in CO2 emissions uh, uh, in France. A second important result is, uh, since it's a simulation, uh, hour by hour uh, for 2030, we can assess security of supply, and we see that regardless of uh, the nuclear capacity kept in the system, security of supply standards are met, uh, so the legal standard in France is three hours of loss load uh, expectation, loss of load expectation, and all the scenarios uh, uh, respect this criteria. So it means that basically, above 40 gigawatts of nuclear capacity, uh, the, mo uh, the additional uh, power production is exported to other countries. It means also that uh, uh, if you look at the graph on the right. Uh, we see uh, the power mix, uh, the power generation in France according to the technology, and uh, we see that uh, the target uh, on the nuclear power plants, uh, on nuclear production, sorry, uh, to reach 50% is not uh, met in 2030 uh, in the 50 gigawatts and in the 63 gigawatt scenario. So uh, what, does, what does it mean now uh, in terms of revenues uh, for the producers? So uh, what of the one of the important results in this study is that uh, the wholesale electricity prices in France will uh, be dependent on the, the nuclear capacity kept in the system. So we observe that the higher uh, the nuclear fleet uh, in the system in 2030, the lower uh, the equilibrium, the 
average uh, equilibrium price on the power market. So we reach, for example, in the high nuclear case, 63 gigawatts, the power price in France are going as low as 23 euros per megawatt hour, uh, megawatt hour according to the simulations. In the 50 gigawatt, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the decrease is less, it's around 42 euros per megawatt hour. And in the 40 uh, gigawatts, we are uh, in the 40 gigawatt scenario. We are uh, even higher at 62 uh, euros per megawatt hour. This has a great implication on the ability of power producers to recover their cost and recover their fixed cost. So in this graph, you have the example for the uh, nuclear uh, producer in France. So we have an estimation uh, of a, a lower and a higher uh, bound. Uh, fixed cost uh, of a nuclear extended fleet, so what uh, would be the cost uh, the nuclear producer would need to uh, uh, cover with their revenues uh, if they want to extend uh, the nuclear power plant. So uh, in the case, in the first case, in the 50 gigawatt case, on the left, we see that uh, the average revenue per uh, kilowatt installed is higher than the, the cost uh, for uh, the, uh, the fixed cost for nuclear production, uh, whereas in the 50 gigawatt scenario on the right, uh, so uh, the second on the right, uh, with uh, 30 euros per ton uh, of CO2, uh, the limit uh, really is, uh, uh, well, it's almost the same than the lower bound of uh, nuclear costs. Uh, so uh, we can see that there, uh, the nuclear producer would barely recover uh, the cost of reinvesting to keep to maintain a 50 gigawatt um, uh, power plant fleet. In another case, in the 50 gigawatt case, if the CO2 price is higher, it's not uh, kept at 30 euros per ton of CO2, but at 50 uh, euros per ton of CO2, we see that the situation is better, and there uh, the 50 gigawatt uh, power plant, uh, nuclear power plant, can recover uh, the cost. Now in the extreme case, on the right, we see a clearly suboptimal situation where the producer uh, selling its power uh, on the market cannot absolutely recover uh, the fixed cost. So we need ad additional cost or we need, uh, would make uh, major losses. Uh, so that is one of the first conclusions of the study. It means that the nuclear, uh, nuclear fleet in France greater than 50 gigawatts while developing renewables as planned uh, in France poses a significant, significant risk of stranded investment in the French power system. Last uh, word, uh, this will also affect uh, the revenues for renewable producers uh, because they, they would, uh, they would, there is uh, 4 billion euros per year difference between high and low scenario of revenues for renewable uh, producers, which so means that this would need to be compensated uh, out of the market through an increase of uh, in energy taxes in France, uh, for example. A third uh, result is uh, we see in all this scenario uh, uh, we develop uh, reasonably uh, flexibility solutions in the system. So flexibility solutions, we uh, talk about demand side uh, response, cross-border exchanges, so then more interconnections, there's uh, electric vehicles with more charging, um, and pumped hydro also and some batteries on the system. All that, uh, what we can say, it helps to uh, keep the curtailment of renewable energy low in all scenario, scenarios in France and uh, Germany. And uh, in Germany, for example, we reach a level uh, uh, where renewable energy can cover more than 80% of national demand during nine weeks in the 2030 and uh, during nine, uh, more than 900 uh, hours 100% of demand is met with renewable energy. In the French power system, the situation is uh, a bit uh, different because uh, renewable, uh, energy, variable renewable energy is lower than in Germany now and will be lower uh, according to the plans in 2030. But still we see that uh, there's also an interest of developing this flexibility solution because it helps coupling uh, the coupling between renewable energy and nuclear. So for example, you can see the graph on the right uh, in the French mix, where you have a stable uh, uh, production during a uh, few days of nuclear, and you have uh, a high variability of production of uh, the wind power, and still uh, on the graph uh, 
uh, on the lower graph, you see that some demand response is activated, some storage is activated, and it helps keep uh, uh, stable the nuclear production and integrate uh, renewable production in the system. Last word, despite these new flexibility solutions, uh, the flexibility provided by conventional uh, generation remains important for the system. So here, look at the graph on the uh, left. Uh, in the German system, we see uh, uh, at the beginning of the week uh, an, an, an event where there's a lot of uh, wind production. And there, uh, you see that coal power plants and gas power plants decrease uh, their production just to make room uh, for uh, the wind production. So it's, it's still important for the system in 2030. So uh, another result is regarding uh, the economics of renewable produce producers. So we saw uh, lately important decrease in the cost of renewable. So we ask ourselves and make, uh, if we continue uh, the decreasing trend toward 2030, what does it mean for renewable producers? Would they be able to recover their costs uh, through market revenues? So we um, take some assumptions on uh, the future PV and wind costs according to uh, a review of literature of, uh, of uh, renewable costs. And the result we found is that mostly PV costs could be covered solely on market revenues by 2030 in France and in Germany. The only exception being uh, the, uh, in the case, uh, in the high nuclear scenario uh, case in France, uh, where the market price decreases uh, importantly, and there uh, the market revenues won't be enough to recover uh, the cost of uh, PV. So here, for example, in France, uh, on the left, you have the results for all uh, uh, the scenarios. The, uh, the in the chart, you see on the left uh, always the average price on the market, and on the right and in yellow, you see uh, the price, uh, the remuneration of PV uh, on this market. So you see that it's always lower. Uh, it means that for the market, uh, uh, renewables are, have a lower market value uh, than the average uh, for production. So on PV, a PV can recover the cost, uh, the only case being when uh, there's too much capacity, conventional capacity in the system. For wind, it's, uh, it's getting there, but it's not yet uh, matching uh, the revenues they get on the market. So it means that wind would need, uh, uh, we still need support in 2030, or it's likely. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in the case where the CO2 price is higher, at 50 euros per ton, uh, it, uh, wind could recover uh, their cost. Uh, last thing, uh, we can compare two scenarios uh, in Germany where we have different, uh, a different level of development of renewables. So it's uh, a 50% uh, renewable jet scenario and a 60% one. And what we see is uh, the remuneration of wind in this case uh, is decreasing in the high uh, renewable scenario. So it shows uh, so by around 20% in, in this case. So it's an illustration of what the, is called the cannibalization effect, where higher uh, renewable uh, production will decrease the revenue for renewable producers. Thank you, Nicola. I will now dig into some results for Germany and also on the German branch European interaction. So the first one is the German mix, you can see here on, on the left, um, in 2016, and in the different scenario we assessed for 2030. Um, in our scenario, we have a, a strong increase of renewables, and the rest of the system is, is uh, carried by uh, coal and gas. What is, first of all, the impact on security of supply? As Nicolas stated, for the French system, security of supply is guaranteed. In the German system, we see the same result. In all the scenarios that we assess, security of supply is guaranteed, even if Germany reduces coal capacity by 60%, and France reduces its nuclear capacity to 40 gigawatts. Second important point is about the market prices. In our scenarios in France and Germany, so here for Germany, here for France, you see that the market average price, in the case we have a CO2 price of 30 euro a ton, would reach in Germany between 42 and 50 euro a megawatt hour. 
It means that even in a cold phase out scenario, this is below the level that we saw during the period 27 to 2012. So yes, there is an increase of the price, but the price level remains low compared to historical values. Now at the same time, you can see that the uh, price comparison between France and Germany could be quite high. Here you see a scenario in France where the price would be as low as about 23 euro megatower, uh, and this is in the case uh, nuclear is maintained at a high level. So the more nuclear capacity is kept in France, and the higher the price difference will be with Germany. Another result re is regarding the CO2 emissions. You see on this graph, or to phrase it simply, in order to meet its climate targets, Germany needs to halve the coal power production by 2030. You see here the coal production, uh, the CO2 emission story of the power sector in Germany today, and you see here the target for 2030. And here you see the result of the different scenario we assessed. On the far right is the scenario that Germany phase out coal and at the same time develop renewable to 60 or more renewables. Here you see that Germany will reach its climate target and this is here this gray, light gray part is the emission which are related to the decision made in France, so different uh, scenarios. What you see is this scenario would allow Germany to meet its target whatever decision will be uh, kept uh, in France regarding the future of nuclear. On the other side, you see here these two scenarios are scenarios where Germany uh, doesn't phase out coal quicker than the technical decommissioning. Here, in the case uh, of a CO2 price of 30 euro, and here in the case of a CO2 price of 50 euro a ton. In both cases, you see that Germany would not meet its climate target, meaning a CO2 price instrument only is not enough for Germany to meet its uh, target. The interesting part that I just highlight also is this codependent uh, impact. Here in light grey, I said is the emission depending on what France will do. So for German emission, the decision made in France will have an impact. The lower, or let's say more or less, nuclear is kept in France leads to less or more fossil power plant production in Germany, and meaning uh, also less or more emission. Uh, the difference ranges from 10 to 20 million tons CO2 in the different scenarios. Now, if Germany moves to push for more renewables, this impact of the French nuclear decision on the German power system and the emission is lower than if uh, Germany doesn't manage to push beyond 50% renewable, uh, its uh, renewable production. Another result is related to uh, the import-export uh, balance of both countries. France and Germany are today the largest uh, exporter, net exporter in Europe, uh, with uh, these are uh, numbers for 2016, but they are a bit different in 2017, but globally, uh, France and Germany export more than 50 terawatt hour uh, yearly uh, as a net export today. Let's see what are the results of our scenario for 2030. So you see here first for France that uh, net exports are increasing in all scenarios. And if the nuclear fleet is kept at 63 gigawatts, so the current level, you see that the exports are more than tripling to 150 terawatt hour. It means that every uh, third or fourth uh, megawatt hour produced in France would then be exported to the rest of Europe. And you see also that the German decision uh, would have actually a very limited impact on uh, the French exports. They have a little impact, but not a big one, just because coal is already a higher marginal cost technology. So it's just by pushing more renewables, this has an impact, uh, more renewable in Germany has a slight impact on the import-export balance in France. Now for Germany, uh, the, the situation is more contrasted. Um, the more Germany will phase out coal to comply with its climate target, and what you see is the more the uh, current export will decrease. And in some scenario, it may even turn into a net import situation. And another important fact is that the net balance of Germany will depend on the decision made by France. This is shown here by uh, these little arrows. Uh, if Germany managed to increase its renewable target to, uh, and reach its target of 60%, we are in that case. And here, uh, the import-export balance is more or less balanced even if France keeps a high level of, of nuclear capacity. 
If France reduces its nuclear capacity, the bil uh, balance in Germany is even uh, slightly positive. On the other side, if Germany doesn't manage to reach its 65% target, and France keeps a high level of nuclear, here you see that in a cold fetal scenario, Germany would actually become a net importer. So more renewable help to keep the German balance more balanced. Let me go to the final result of, of this study, which is related to the um, cross-border exchanges between two countries. On this graph, you see the daily balance and import exports of both countries in a scenario where we have 50 gigawatts in France and in a scenario where we have 60% renewable in Germany in a coal phase So what you see, despite this divergence of the power mix, uh, both countries have actually an interest in uh, continental cooperation and exchange, uh, use the exchange potential. Um, for Germany, this is very clear. Um, there is a situation of imports uh, when uh, there is a lack of uh, wind and, and sun resources. It is cheaper to import than to produce with gas power plants in Germany. And there is a situation of export where there is a lot of wind and sun resources. So integration helps to European integration helps to integrate variable renewables at the regional level. For France, uh, we see that there is globally export, as we just mentioned before. But here again, there is a situation where France will benefit from importing, uh, especially in the winter. And so this strategy is indeed uh, mostly focusing on uh, need of export uh, op op options. And for that, uh, uh, France would need to build more interconnectors and also for the economics would benefit from a higher CO2 price. So here again, an interest in growing exchange and cross-border cooperation. So to finish, uh, I think the uh, French-German agenda has been quite active also before the summer break. Uh, we had important political declaration in, in, uh, in, in the French-German context in June and July. Uh, at the Meserberg summit, uh, French German government meeting, and then during the uh, meeting of the two ministers, um, former minister Hulot um, uh, and uh, minister Altmaier, and both governments have agreed that it is needed to better coordinate the energy transition strategies. And furthermore, both ministries have uh, set up a high-level group uh, which is charged to uh, think and implement or test potential instruments uh, potential new cooperation to facilitate the transition. These uh, are, are good, important results, and some of this declaration actually picked up some of the recommendations we made in our study, uh, which was published in, in, in spring. So we are quite happy about that. But uh, let's have a look at what we propose in terms of learning for the energy cooperation. So the first thing is, as I said, it is important, and now we have a timing, for refining both national strategies on coal and nuclear in both countries, based on the renewable energy target. But it goes beyond, because since we see this cross-border impact, it is important to initiate consultation on this cross-border uh, dimension. And this has been picked up by the declar declaration, especially in the framework of this new instrument, government instrument at the European level, which is this uh, new um, energy and climate plan consultation. So both countries agreed to test if they could even jointly write uh, part of their national strategies uh, or like a little chapter on cross-border impact. Uh, now another uh, learning is uh, both countries should engage joint action for the implementation of the energy transition in Europe, bilaterally, regionally and at the European level. And here we propose two reflections, one on cross-border re uh, res auction, and this has been picked up by the declaration, but also on regional cooperation on CO2 pricing. And here the formulation of the declaration is more timid, there is a wish to test if such instrument could be uh, useful to be implemented. Finally, uh, we came with a broader recommendation for potentially, why not, a political deal between the two countries. Germany could commit to a CO2 minimum price, and France could commit to reduce its nuclear generation capacity. As a result, the emission would decrease in Europe or in both countries. Market could refinance uh, a low carbon asset more effectively, and electricity trades would be more balanced in both countries. This recommendation uh, has been launched to the debate, is not yet taken really uh, by the government. It is obviously a very controversial one. So with this, um, we went through the study. You can have a, a, a look on our website as I, I described, and here are the key findings again. And we are now very happy to take uh, the different questions. I hope you had a, a lot of questions during the presentation uh, that we will answer now. 
So let me have a look. Here. Uh, I saw it for a moment, but... Okay, I see your first question that I will actually ask uh, Nicolas yeah. to answer, if, if you wish. Um, it is a big technical question about the hypothesis uh, in terms of renewable development um, and uh, yes. also in terms of coal phase out. So the question is, what is the hypothesis of uh, renewable uh, energy development? So what we did uh, at the time of the study, uh, there was only the paper of 2016 available. So it gave uh, two pathways uh, of development of each uh, renewable technology in 2023. Uh, so a higher and a lower one. And what we did is uh, an average between these two. And we projected it uh, to 2030 because we didn't have uh, the specific uh, development that we will happen uh, for this technology. But still, France had uh, the objective of reaching 40% uh, electricity production from renewable at this time, so it was the the best um, way of doing it, basically. Uh, so all these hypotheses, also you can find it uh, in the study. So coal phase out uh, in France, uh, it's uh, an exogenous uh, hypothesis that uh, is put in the model. Uh, also, because there's a question about if coal phase out is a result uh, from policy decision or a result of the model, it's a result then uh, from policy decisions in your study. So, this is something where taken to come. We have here maybe a question from uh, Matthäus Bassani, a PhD yeah. candidate of energy and consumer law, a visiting researcher at the Max Planck uh, Institute, MPEL. The question is, and uh, maybe Nicola can answer this one again, which are the main differences between the energy distribution generation systems between the countries? And is the electricity price paid to the consumer sufficient to incentivize renewables? So I think we covered this uh, through the presentation, but maybe you can go. Which are the main differences between the energy distribution? Uh, the main di differences between, uh, so energy distribution uh, generation is like the, um, uh, the energy mix, right? Uh, th that's what uh, they say. So the, m the main difference is in both countries, uh, you have uh, re uh, uh, development of renewable energy uh, generation. Uh, so in Germany, it goes uh, a bit further, and uh, there's a lot of uh, wind and PV. Uh, in France, you're reaching uh, 200, more than 200 terawatts from renewable production but uh, around 80 uh, terawatts are already coming from uh, existing hydro plants. So, uh, so there's less uh, renewable, uh, variable renewable production in the system. Uh, the electricity price paid by the consumer, uh, so uh, the question also continues and it says, is the electricity price paid by the consumer sufficient to incentivize renewables? But we didn't go, went that further to uh, um, analyze uh, the electricity price paid by the consumer. What we can say is the electricity price uh, uh, from the market, from the power market, is uh, in some cases enough to cover the uh, uh, fixed costs of generation. So it means that there's no need for additional contribution from the consumer. In the case, in the um, scenarios where it's not the case, uh, you can have either two situations. One uh, where it's uh, coming, uh, so there's additional uh, revenue streams uh, coming from the consumer bill. So it could uh, we could imagine first uh, energy taxation, for example, for um, uh, financing the development of renewables, but uh, you, you have also, for example, revenues from capacity market that can also be added to uh, the consumer's bill, or uh, in just a suboptimal situation. So we, uh, uh, so in this case, uh, maybe it's uh, the uh, scenario where it won't happen uh, in, uh, in this case. I will take the next question from Mike Pa. It's a simple one. What mm -hmm. was the assumed uh, WAC, so the weighted average uh, cost for renewables? In our study, we take a 5% WAC. Um, so, the uh, next one is related to the revenue gap uh, assessed for nuclear units uh, based in energy only remuneration. So, the question is does it uh, imply also that we calculate uh, revenue from the capacity market? The answer is no. 
so in this graph we showed um, the revenue gap is only uh, let me go again to this slide here wait a sec oops here we are so the question was if here we have some remuneration also which are coming from the capacity payment so the answer is no it's only the revenue from the energy only market now the capacity payment would indeed add a little top up on that uh, currently, I think the, pa the capacity payment, you may know better uh, than me, Nicole, mm -hmm. the exact mm -hmm. number, but it's quite low, actually. Mm -hmm. So we would have actually indeed a little uh, top up on that, but uh, according to the forecast, it would not be massively change the picture. No, uh, for the moment, no. It's uh, slower than that. So let's go to the next question. Um, what do you think about efficiency increased by fossil cogeneration plants? It's targeting mostly France. Uh, France seems to ban with the new PPE, so the new multi-year plan, this technology, even though it is a good one when it is needed on site. So, Nicolas, could you comment on that? Yes. Uh, well, it's true that France uh, has the, the will to ban uh, fossil generation, new uh, addition of capa uh, fossil uh, generation capacity uh, in the next PPE. It's not uh, done yet. Still, uh, what we see in the study is until 2030, with the existing capacity, so in, uh, in this system, in the, uh, in the study, we still have, for example, the CCGTs that, uh, and the gas turbines that are existing uh, now in the system. You can reduce uh, the capacity uh, of nuclear, develop uh, renewable production, and still don't need additional um, uh, uh, technologies. So uh, it means that there might be uh, a need for that in the future if you want to go further, but uh, if you can also imagine a system where uh, uh, renewable and nuclear can combine and you don't need uh, additional uh, fossil generation, actually it's also it would be uh, good in terms of emissions because uh, obviously uh, fossil generation can uh, increase again uh, CO2 emissions if it's uh, done like that. Um, so there is a lot of uh, challenging questions, also very technical mm -hmm. one. I will take this one from Mr. Zeller from Fraunhofer. Is it uh, asking any estimation on uh, breaking capacity, so inertia contribution of both countries at 2030 time horizon in order to ensure short time balancing? So this is indeed an interesting question. Uh, the answer is quite easy. We didn't assess this uh, problematic mm -hmm. uh, in detail, as uh, also we. Um, we didn't model the grid very uh, carefully and we just have actually single nodes for uh, countries in our model so one node for Germany, one node for France and the neighboring countries uh, and we didn't look into these kind of short-term balancing issues the German one maybe Germany has installed one. so we have here a no. question which is not attributed to anybody but the question is Germany has installed 100 gigawatts of renewables which produce 25% of its electricity at a price which is double for household compared to France without diminishing its CO2 emission. Uh, in the 65 renewable scenario, as what is the installed capacity? What is the installed capacity? I suppose the rest is gas. So the first part of the question, the cost, so if you, if you refer to today, indeed the cost paid by German consumer are higher. I'm not sure it's the sense of the question, but it is because of the installation of uh, of uh, wind and solar power plants which were historically at high costs uh, but the cost today we have a cost assumption for the future cost of renewables in France and Germany are becoming uh, relatively similar one reason is uh, that uh, we expect also the volume in France uh, in renewable development to grow and so with the economy of scale better legislation we see a convergence of the costs globally investment costs in both countries and at the same time the resources in France are better than the one in Germany better wind and better sun condition so globally the cost of renewable is even lower in France than it is in Germany uh, regarding the mix we have indeed 65% rest scenario we have uh, some remaining lignite for, for Germany sorry we have some remaining lignite and hard coal in the mix uh, and the rest is indeed gas uh, which is basically the um, figures that we take from the uh, 
power development plan from the um, TSOs, so the Net and Igloox plan in, in Germany. Hmm. So I, I can take the next one. So there's a simple uh, question. What would be the optimum scenario for EU? So low emissions and low cost for EU compet competitiveness. Well, uh, I would just simply refer to the European strategy, the energy union, that has three pillars. It's uh, the protection, the um, uh, sustainability, so the protection of environments, and there you're talking about low emissions. There's another pillar, which is affordability. Uh, so uh, low cost for EU competitiveness, uh, low cost for citizens, but also for uh, the industry. And uh, the third one about security of supply that uh, is important in terms of gas, but also important in terms of electricity when we consider uh, when in the context where you have a major transformation on, uh, of the power system now. Um, I have another question on France. Uh, so France has just decided to invest 25 billion euros to install uh, wind turbines. Given a capacity of factor of 0.3, uh, this means 25 billion euros for one gigawatt uh, average. Well, I, I'm not sure about uh, the math there. Uh, this will not change the CO2 emissions in France. Uh, the only the effect would be to increase the megawatts, etc. Et Does this make any, any sense? Well, there I, I would say that uh, it's true that uh, uh, like adding renewable to a system that is already decarbonized will not have. Um, major effect on CO2 emissions. But still, uh, there's good reasons uh, for doing that, and that's why it's uh, in the policy. And the another one reason is what mentioned uh, Dimitri at the beginning, is that we're in a context, a context of aging nuclear power points, pl plants. And also, uh, so there will be a point where France will need to think about how to replace uh, this production, and it could make sense to develop renewables, and that's the direction that the policy in France uh, has taken. And uh, uh, the second one is renewable. Uh, there's been also important decrease in uh, renewable costs, so it could make sense also to develop uh, this technology to prepare uh, the future. Uh, and the third one, it's true that it doesn't change the CO2 emissions in, in France, but in an interconnected uh, system, it's still interesting to have uh, decarbonized uh, production that could be also exported to other countries and uh, to support kind of the decarbonization of the overall Europe and not only France. There is an interesting question or maybe clarification about the um, number which was quoted about 930 hours of a renewable uh, situation where the renewable in Germany are surpassing the power demand. And the question is, does it mean that this is curtailed? The answer is no, not, not at all. Uh, during this situation, often the exports are actually uh, pushed, so there is still room actually for having more than 100% um, renewable of, of the demand. And also, it is sometimes actually uh, used for other uh, electric, uh, like charging electric vehicles typically, or it activates the uh, pumping, uh, pump storage in Germany or in a uh, neighboring country. The level of curtailment is much lower. It's, uh, Yearly, and because we didn't uh, also assess curtailment driven by grid congestions, but uh, the level of curtailment is, is below 5 terawatt hour during the year. Um, I may take another one, uh, which is related to the role of battery energy storage. Um, so, in our scenarios, we uh, build our assumptions on what the grid operators uh, for forecast for 2030 in terms of development of batteries. And um, in Germany, uh, in our scenario, we have put 4.5 gigawatts of uh, battery storage. And also we have some pumped hydro in Germany. Um, in Germany, but also in the zone which is connected to Germany, so Luxembourg and Austria. Uh, this has actually a good uh, flexibility potential. The question is, will this capacity really come in the system? This is uh, one which didn't we didn't assess. But it helps to maintain the value of renewables. When uh, Nicola was showing that there is this cardinalization effect, it is not very strong in our scenarios. One of the reasons is that actually battery is helping to sustain the value of renewables. In France, we have actually already a good storage, uh, hydro storage. Uh, the TSO in the forecast we, we, we took doesn't see new batteries coming at this time or reason. So we just took these numbers, but it sees new uh, pumped hydro installed in France. This helps, and there is a whole analysis in the report if you want to look in more detail, but it uh, also helps significantly to uh, sustain the, the value of, of renewables. Okay, uh, maybe the one on the interconnections? Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah, uh, so 
Hi, uh, the question is, hi, could you elaborate on the need to develop interconnection between France and Germany? I, uh, I understand that only the TYNDP projects have been considered. Uh, also, has the impact of flows in other regions been analyzed in the study modeling? Thank you. So, um, what we did is uh, exactly we based an, uh, our analysis on the TYNDP and we projected what uh, project would be uh, realistically uh, online in 2030 according to historical levels of uh, implementation. So, but it means that now we are in 2018 uh, in the interconnectors. Uh, that are developed, uh, we mainly consider those that are advanced in the process, uh, either construction started or authorization and finance, uh, finance granted. Uh, so all the uh, hypotheses are in, uh, um, the, uh, in the study. We also obviously uh, studied the impact of flows in other regions, so all countries that are connected either to France and Germany and for the uh, third countries uh, they've been grouped uh, to regions to also uh, assess the whole um, European power system. I will take this one, uh, which is a bit of a more political one, uh, maybe asked by a ge German person, if I read it correctly, not sure, but it is not named. But uh, the question is, why should we follow a policy mix where one French company profits and all industry in Germany and France uh, face a CO2 minimum price? So this is at the core also of our investigation, this question of redistribution. Indeed, we, sh we showed that uh, a, CO2, a higher CO2 price would actually benefit to low carbon technologies. It would benefit both to nuclear and also to renewables, but it would obviously have an impact on high carbon technologies, uh, meaning coal. So um, uh, there is actually, and we, we show this a bit in more detail in the report, this distribution effect. It benefits to some stakeholders in uh, basically mostly to uh, the nuclear producer and the renewable generators in, in both countries. And it impacts consumers and also uh, like high emitting producers in both countries. Why should we uh, actually go for this direction? Uh, in order to bypass this problematic and this asymmetric benefit, this is why we propose this kind of broader political deal. In, uh, if uh, there is also a commitment uh, from France and there is good economic reason to do so, to resize nuclear fleet, then it would potentially limit this effect also. But globally, this is exactly the core of this, of, of this uh, dynamic and, and ant antinomy in the, in, in the debate. Maybe, Nicolas, you want to add some, some perspective on that? No, I think it's okay. Okay. Uh, I think you, you summarized it well. Uh, so next question, uh, the wind correlation between France and Germany is large. If one country needs to export in case of excess production, the other will be in the same situation. Did you take this effect in consideration? Well, actually we did. Uh, we did. Uh, so that's the whole point of uh, doing these assessments uh, on, uh, hour by hour uh, in 2030. So we see this correlation. I it happens and we uh, see what happens on the system. So. Obviously, we have uh, moments where there's wind in France and Germany, and there uh, you have uh, effect on, for example, the power market, uh, average price is lower. But still, there is room in 2030, mostly, for uh, these kind of situations. Uh, and th there's some curtailments at some, uh, at some time, when there's no demand, and we, you cannot activate demand uh, in response of uh, prices. So well, if you're really interested to dig into this, uh, you have online uh, the Excel spreadsheet with uh, the data uh, and the results of the, the modeling um, hour by hour, and you can see this correlation uh, by, uh, by yourself. And if you have any question, you can uh, pass it on to us. Um, so I will take a last one. Unfortunately, we will not be able to answer all these questions because we still have a lot, but we will come back to you uh, personally uh, through emails. Um, the last one I will take is uh, potentially, uh, let me go through quickly, uh, the question of uh, sectoral integration, to which extent we have been taken, uh, we took into consideration sectoral integration in our scenarios. So we have, by the time horizon 2030, in our scenario, some development of electric vehicles, some development of heat pumps. Uh, so we have, uh, based on the assumption of the TSOs in both countries, started to integrate this dimension. And our model is able to uh, model uh, flexibly the demand response of these different users. So also there will be place 
in order to integrate um, better renewables. It has not been done in a systematic way and we do not have a, a perspective for 2050 where we would really uh, need to speak about industrial sector integration, uh, hydrogen economy. This has not been modeled, but we modeled, as I said, two use, which has uh, heat, so heat pumps, heat and uh, electricity integration and electric vehicles. So uh, looking at the time, um, I think um, it's ab about t 12 uh, now in Berlin. Uh, I believe we had an interesting webinar and uh, all these questions show that you had uh, a lot of good input, good questions, uh, some of them being uh, very technical, others uh, more at the political level. Uh, and as I said, we will, uh, we will come uh, back to you um, with uh, written, um, written answers. Um, if you wish to be kept up to date with our events and, and publication, I, I recommend you uh, to, to subscribe to the newsletters both of IDRI and also of, of Agara Nagivende. You can find this newsletter on our respective websites. Uh, these are not spam. Uh, we will not uh, spam you with mailings, uh, but we, you will receive only a few uh, interesting updates about our work and upcoming activities. So I think this is an interesting added value. And uh, again, we are also present online on our YouTube ch channel, but we are also present uh, physically in all the different meetings we organize, conferences. Uh, so we will be happy to also meet you in person uh, in the next time we have the opportunity. Uh, so once again, thank you very much uh, for this. I see I still have a bit of time, but uh, we will just uh, let you breathe a little bit before going to your lunch break. So uh, once again, thank you and uh, uh, see you next time. Uh, uh, Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.